Hey guys, Potato here with a video about my thoughts on Age of Empires 3. The purpose of this video is to document and explain the reasons I didn't like Age of Empires 3 and my hope is that I can maybe generate some interesting discussion about not only Age of Empires 3 but the upcoming Age of Empires 4 as well. For some information about my background, I've been playing RTS games for 20 years now and I've basically played every single one that's come out on PC, with a few exceptions. I've put thousands of hours into not only playing RTS games, but also analysing and discussing them with my friends and the internet at large. That said, I'm not a professional level player, I'm firmly and happily a casual. I play games primarily for fun and socialisation. With that out of the way, I want to start off and say that I don't think Age of Empires 3 is an objectively bad game. The main bulk of my complaints with the game have to do with the fact that I felt it was a bad Age of Empires game. 3's biggest crime is that it wasn't as good as the games that came before it. I felt it was unfocused and underdesigned. I felt it had stripped away a lot of the things that were integral to the Age of Empires franchise and added in a lot of stuff that didn't belong, which ultimately left it in a weird sort of identity purgatory where it's too different to be called an Age of Empires game, but not different enough to be its own game. The game in a vacuum is actually pretty fun but my expectations for the game did not match the game that I got, which is why I consider it to be the most disappointing game in this series. If you include Age of Empires Online, then it's second. But if Age of Empires Online didn't have an awful monetization model, then it would probably actually rank higher than Age of Empires 3. I think it would be fair to call me a purist when it comes to real-time strategy games, games in general, and in particular my expectations of franchises. It's a perfectly legitimate area to criticise me on, and it's it's something you should keep in mind while you're considering my opinion. Just to give you an example of how purist I am, I loved the original XCOM UFO defense or its alternative title UFO Enemy Unknown, but I initially hated the much loved 2012 revival XCOM Enemy Unknown almost entirely because the game didn't stick to the traditional ways of the franchise. That's pretty purist, possibly even irrationally so. I sometimes don't like it when things change and I have a hard time accepting a new product if it wears a an old product's name but isn't exactly the way that I remember the old product. Just think of me as the video game equivalent of an old man yelling at a cloud. This is my bias clearly stated before I give you my opinion on Age of Empires 3. When I was asked why I don't like the game, my first gut reaction was that it didn't feel like an Age of Empires game. It was weird, unfocused and too different. It threw out a lot of the things that were hallmarks of the series and brought in stuff that I felt didn't belong. Take the economy point portion of the game for example. One of the fundamental characteristics of villagers has always been that they pick up resources and then they walk back to an appropriate drop off point. This is entirely missing in Age of Empires 3 and it really hurts how the game feels in my opinion. I understand why this was removed and I understand the arguments in favour of removing it but I felt it was too much of a departure from the core mechanics that I and many other people are familiar with. There's a valid argument that it makes the gameplay better and more accessible but accessible gameplay isn't the all-father in the pantheon of game design gods. For me, mechanics are the primordial soup from which the gods of games emerge. If you take mechanics out, the god of gameplay and the goddess of game feel that emerge from that soup are not the same anymore. If you change the primordial soup to suit the gameplay, you've imbalanced the delicate marriage of how a game plays and how a game feels. The balanced relationship is notoriously difficult to preserve when you're iterating or innovating a sequel for a franchise. Trying to balance making the game feel fresh and familiar at the same time is probably the hardest barrier that a designer faces when they're creating a sequel. If you get that balance between them wrong, you might have a really good game, but your original audience can become extremely hostile to your new game and be willing to tell everyone just how much they hate it. I feel that if you strip away a fundamental core mechanic, you have to have a really damn good reason, because if you're not careful, you're going to alienate the most passionate and purest in your audience from the get-go. In my opinion, it would have been far more interesting to build upon the villager drop-off mechanic rather than removing it entirely. Entirely. For example, you could make it so that the resource drop-off points generate little trade wagons that run to the nearest town centre to drop off the collected resources into the global stockpile. It's not that that idea is a great idea, but I would have preferred it to their solution of, hey guys, let's just remove villagers carrying resources to stockpiles to make the game easier. Their solution doesn't sound fun to me, and it doesn't feel like it improves the game, especially when the games were already pretty accessible to begin with, and you're removing complexity to appeal 
appeal to a wider audience when elements of that very same complexity is what drew your audience in the first place. I personally favor simple yet deep mechanics over complex mechanics that are approachable and I would wager there are a lot of people who feel the same way. It just felt like a really lazy and uninspired thing to do when you have so many potential directions to explore. Now in the defense of the developers of Age of Empires 3, I've had 14 years or so to think about this and I'm sure at least some of them would acknowledge what I'm saying as valuable feedback. But sadly, that's not the only way they messed around with the economy game. The home city system is its own can of worms that needs to be dissected, but let's zoom in on its impacts on the economy side of the game. A lot of builds revolve around getting key shipments of several hundred wood, other units or resources. I feel like this is way too opaque. And I mean, sure, you can check your opponent's deck if you want, but you have to jump out of the main game and go into a menu and you have to know what you're looking for. And it just feels like there's this huge burden of knowledge on the gameplay to try and read what another player is doing. Contrast this system to Age of Empires 2. If I want to know what you're doing in Age of Empires, I just have to scout your town. If I roll up into your town in the early game and see that you've been taking stone and there's some villagers missing, I can make a prediction that you're going to be doing a fast castle into a castle drop or a tower rush, depending on the phase of the game. I don't need to go into a menu to get this information. It's all there readable in the gameplay and using in-game mechanics like scouting. The aging up system was a step back from Age of Mythology system and became a reinforcing point of the home city's negative impacts on the economy. I would have honestly preferred not picking politicians at all because your build and timings were heavily influenced by them in a really opaque and gamey way instead of being visible simply based on what your opponent was doing. Farms and plantations were a fundamental alteration of the underlying economic mechanics that was done in what I would regard as a careless way. Farms are another one of those things that I consider a core mechanic of Age of Empires. Transitioning from a hunter-gatherer economy is done gradually, adding farms as local resources run out. In tree, you just drop a mill and you're good for 10 farmers. Even though the mechanic is still there, it feels different and wrong in some way. And that's without talking about the gameplay implications of farms being really small and compact into consideration, which made raiding really swingy and empires feel really small. Plantations were an obvious attempt to address the problem of gold running out on the map, but again the solution just feels kind of lazy, uninteractive and uninspiring. If you were to combine the resource transportation idea I had earlier, you could make a really cool and interesting interaction. Maybe if you deliver the cotton to a dock you own, it gets shipped to the old world using a little trade cog that an enemy player can intercept. Maybe if you've lost a water war, you have to turn to the local natives to smuggle your cotton out to get some coin at a lower yield than transporting it to the the old world yourself, and maybe if you're really stuck, you can get a base yield from delivering it to your town center. Again, I'm not trying to say that my ideas are the greatest, but I'm just trying to illustrate how boring and uninteractive I think it is to drop a plantation, stick 10 villagers on it, and then forget about it. Now, before the high skill level players jump down my throat, I know all about the importance of map control, and if you're building plantations, you're pretty much admitting that you're behind, but just bear with me, okay? Now I'm not going to go into depth about how solving the gold running out problem may not even be a problem that needs to be addressed. I will mention for what it's worth that it formed an interesting part of the metagame in previous games, but I will give Age of Empires 3 the benefit of the doubt here and accept that maybe the problem did need to be solved due to the setting of the game. If I can accept that, I think you can accept that maybe they solve the problem in a boring and unfun way. I want to end this talk on the economics of Age of Empires 3 on a positive note. The herding mechanics and the pasture building are two really cool ideas that I actually love about the game and I would be 100% okay with seeing them returning in new games. In fact, I would even be happy with them being ported into the Age of Empires 2 if it were possible. That's how much I think those are great mechanics. So you see, it's not all doom and gloom. I don't think they got everything about the game wrong. I just feel they messed with the fundamental identity and fabric of the economy game too much and it came out not feeling like an Age of Empires game. Now on their own, these changes would not be a huge deal for the game, but we're already elbow deep into this fiasco of a video and I've only talked about the economy. 
So let's move on to the single player campaign. My biggest complaint against the campaign is again they departed from the fundamental roots of the franchise which were historical campaigns set in the real world rise and fall of empires and civilizations. Instead of getting an awesome campaign about colonialism, conquering the frontiers and the rise of America in a world of people's revolutionary wars, we got some ahistoric fantasy stuff with some dude whose name is Black and he's a Scottish Knight of Malta and he's like fighting some mysterious circle guys with white animals and hits his great granddaughter narrating the story and she's important somehow. Seriously, what the fuck is going on here? I went back to try and play through the campaign again to do research for this video, but I honestly couldn't finish it. It just started to upset me with how convoluted it was and how badly they had put it together from a narrative standpoint. The actual missions were okay and kind of interesting to play through, but it was missing that Age of Empires charm. It was too detached from the real world, which made it feel like it didn't belong in the franchise. The thing that drew me into Age of Empires was the historical setting of the campaigns. It's the same thing that draws me into the Civilization series. The idea that I could be the guy running a historical empire is really interesting to me. I don't want to be some fantasy Scottish knight fighting a mysterious secret society with albino doges. I want to be the British Empire trying to stomp down the American rebellion. I want to be the French people revolting against the crown. I want to be the Austrians trying to save the French monarchy from the revolution. I want to be Napoleon, George Washington and Kai Wilhelm. I want to be the dude in the driver's seat of empire in history, not some fairy dancing off in the fantasy land. That's part of why I'm angry about Age of Empires 3's story. They took what is possibly the most interesting and defining eras of human history for shaping the modern world and they use it as an unimportant backdrop for a bad fan fiction. There's a part in the story where the Turk guy says he knew the Ottomans were a thing of the past when the time frame of the game is literally set during during one of the heights of their power. And that's the insult added to the injury here. Not only did we get an ahistorical story, it was inaccurate for what little history it tried to include and the characters were really poorly written stereotypes. History is littered with incredibly engaging and interesting characters with really, really powerful personalities that deserve to get their airtime. I don't need you to make people up. Don't try it. There's way more interesting and real people out there. So please try to tell us their stories in the next game. They could have done so much more with the setting when it comes to the campaigns and it really feels like they dropped the ball. Now I will end this with a caveat. I didn't finish the campaign, nor did I play through the expansion campaigns. By the time the expansions came out back in the day, I had lost interest in Age of Empires 3 and I was discovering milsim shooters and MMOs. As I said, I did try to go back and play the campaigns, but it took so much out of me and I didn't enjoy it that I really just couldn't bring myself to finish them. Next I want to talk about the art style and graphics of the game. I personally think that Age of Empires 3 looks worse than Age of Empires 2. Now technologically, Age of Empires 3 is far superior. It has real 3D graphics, better resolution, really awesome building and ship debris and damage models, as well as more impressive special effects. My problem isn't anything to do with what Age of Empires 3 does technically, it's just that they didn't properly account for the art design challenges that come with making a 3D RTS game. If we take a look at Rise of Nations for example, a game that came out two years earlier than Age of Empires 3 and is technically inferior in terms of its graphical prowess, the game looks way better in motion in my opinion. I Symmetric views mean that the developer has to lay out the information clearly for the player in the most concise way possible, so that there's no confusion due to the changing perspective of the camera. Going from a strict isometric style to a freeform 3D pseudo isometric style killed a lot of games in this era and Age of Empires 3 is a prime example for me. I found the game unreadable and unviewable and it was like looking through mud when previous games like Age of Empires 2 and Rise of Nations I had no problem looking at and reading the gameplay. Even Age of Mythology had this visual clarity issue, but I think the incredibly distinct style of each Civ's units, buildings and special units helped make it easier to read the battle. It's pretty hard to mistake a Hydra for another kind of unit, but it's way easier to misread a unit in Age of Empires 3 in my experience. If you look at the difference between a Militia, Man at Arms, Longsword, Two-Handed Swordsman and a Champion in Age of Empires 2, they all look incredibly visually distinct thanks to the strong aesthetic and clear isometric 2D graphics. If you look at the Musketmen in Age of Empires 3, the upgrades are much less obvious. It's much more difficult to make the distinction between the upgraded unit because 
the overall aesthetic design choices in the presentation of the game. Now granted, provided you played the game enough, you could easily overcome this barrier and learn what all the units look like. But my point here is that the lack of visual clarity and the lack of isometric views made it hard for me to get into the game or even just read the gameplay. Things just kind of look muddy and difficult to read for me and that's a real problem if I'm going to try and like your game. And that's without touching on some of the UI elements of the game. Health bars are quite difficult to read for boats, especially if you're a blue player for example. It's not awful, but it's just not good enough. Now granted, previous games weren't the best for this either, but I feel like 3 didn't really try to get it going in the right direction. There are some really good things about the graphics in AoE 3. Technically speaking, it was a pretty damn decent game for its time. If you consider Crisis 1 came out two years later in 2007, the game was in no way a slacker when it comes to graphics. When buildings and boats were being destroyed, they broke apart in a really satisfying manner. Visually interesting building designs and graphical special effects help bring the world to life, but half the time they kind of end up obscuring what's going on rather than supporting it and providing atmosphere. Although to be fair, most of us back then probably didn't have the computer to run Age of Empires 3 at a good rate, let alone Crisis. That's the bones of my complaints with the graphics of Age of Empires 3. They're not terrible, they simply lack visual clarity and differ too much from the previous games and they didn't stick to the isometric style, which I feel made the gameplay really easy to read in the previous installments of the franchise, excluding Age of Mythology. So now we move on to gameplay mechanics. Now I briefly touched on some stuff about the economy mechanics so I won't talk about them too much more. What I do want to talk about though are the things that were changed in Age of Empires 3 that I didn't like. One of the most significant changes to the gameplay is how they handle the terrain. Forests for example are no longer impassable for units. This can make it very frustrating to try and control the space around your town. Instead you can walk right through without any problems at all. Now I understand making forests pathable if they had done it in a meaningful or interesting way. For example, if infantry got a defensive bonus from ranged attacks while they're in a forest, uh, perhaps cavalry couldn't go at full speed in a forest, or maybe, maybe the forest was impassable only to siege units. But instead it felt like they removed a fundamental game mechanic from the game and left nothing in its place. This makes it so that the distinction between a closed and open map in Age of Empires 3 is harder to define, and the identity of those maps are weaker, as well as there being less options for defense finding those maps when it comes to map creation and generation. Additionally in Age of Empires 2, hills and cliffs had a significant impact on the gameplay with units taking less damage and doing more if they were on a hill and just doing more damage if they were shooting down a cliff. To my knowledge this is completely missing from Age of Empires 3. I didn't test it so please correct me if I'm wrong but this is just another area where core mechanics of the series were stripped away without anything new being put in their place. I would go as far as to say that the game play suffered due to these missing things on many different levels. Another change they made to the core fundamental gameplay is that units are now produced in batches of five instead of coming out one by one. This might not seem like a huge deal, but let's just say I wanted to get out a couple of anti-cavalry units to drive off some light cavalry that were harassing my wood line. In Age of Empires 2 I can just pop out a couple of spearmen, move them out to push the cavalry off. In Age of Empires 3 I have to wait the full time it takes to produce five units even though I might only only want one or two really quick. Another change is that you can no longer garrison units in their production buildings when you create them and garrisoning units in buildings in general feels really underwhelming overall. In Age of Empires 2 you really felt the difference between a tower firing one arrow and a tower firing a bunch of arrows. In 3 you don't really feel the impact from units garrisoned in a building either through extra shots, higher rate of fire or damage. Now those things are almost certainly there in some form but the game does a really poor job of communicating that visually and mechanically in the gameplay. It would have been so cool in the era of guns to be able to garrison a few units in a fort and actually see them shooting out. It would be absolutely well within the realm of possibility for the game but for whatever reason they just didn't do it. Which kind of leads us into defensive buildings being basically worthless. They're trivial to deal with even if they're upgraded and you only have a small amount of infantry. Now this was somewhat true of towers in the other games but I think this was particularly the case here, especially because of how they changed how the walls and map mechanics work. Forts should be incredibly powerful defensive structures manable by your infantry. 
but instead they felt like a speed bump on the way to your enemy's base, and they can be torn down with a couple of dozen infantry if they're not actively defended. Now I will say this, I have some knowledge of the high level gameplay for Age of Empires 3, and I know that forts absolutely have a lot of relevance for the high level play. To talk about walls a little bit more, it seems like they kept the grid based building system for some things in Age of Empires 3, but decided that for some reason walls should operate differently. This introduces huge problems with the viability of walls, and as a result, the viability of defensive buildings in general. Walls can snap to your other buildings in the world, but only on the origin of the wall. This makes the actual process of walling really fiddly and really difficult, and can easily lead to situations where you think you've walled off correctly, but the game decides that you can't just fill in that last little gap with a wall, so now the entire wall is useless. This is compounded by forests being pathable, so it's really hard to find things to use with your wall to make a secure base. If they had kept the grid based building system from previous games, I think this would have been a much better implementation. The few high level games I've watched of people playing the game had very little wall building unless there was an already extremely advantageous choke point to wall. These new wall mechanics interacted with terrain elevation in really dumb ways as well, especially when you were building gates, which was probably the second most fiddly thing about walls aside from actually placing them. I remember I was building a wall near a body of water and it looked like you shouldn't be able to path around it, but by actually placing the wall I managed to raise the elevation of the ground, which meant that the entire enemy army could just waltz around my wall like it wasn't even there. To further make walls and defensive structures in general useless, they gave every single unit in the game a ranged siege attack. Now perhaps it made more sense logically than swordsmen hitting buildings and archers shooting them, but it changed the game in ways I don't think they fully compensated for in other areas of the game's mechanics. All this stuff together makes the defensive game in Age of Empires 3 feel really crap on both sides of the fence. There's no satisfaction from destroying the enemy's fortification because they're too trivial to deal with, and playing defensively doesn't feel good because your outposts feel useless. In fact, walls and defensive structures are their most viable only when you're on the offensive and trying to contain your enemy and gain map control. They literally do not seem to help you at all when you're on the defensive. Now that's my impression of how they worked in the game. Maybe if you've been playing the game a lot or you play at a really high level you have a different impression of them, so please just keep that in mind. Any one or two of these changes to the fundamental gameplay of Age of Empires probably would have been perfectly fine, but with so many changes happening all at once, it felt like they were really difficult to incorporate them into the identity of the game. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you shouldn't change anything, but you need to be careful about what you change, how much you change it, and how it impacts the other game systems, and how it feels to play your game. But we're not done yet kids, because maps were much smaller in Age of Empires 3, which took away that feeling that you were building this grand empire, and instead it felt like you were managing this small outpost. Now granted with the setting of the game, that at least makes consistent sense, but it really just hurt how the game felt in my opinion. Age of Empires has always been about a large scale empire in my mind. It's not about micromanaging small number of units, and that does have its place in the game, particularly the early game, the driving force behind the gameplay should be the pursuit of massing a giant army and killing your opponent with it. It's hard to feel like your army is big when your entire empire feels cramped and contained in a paradoxically wide open map that feels really small and gives you no room to breathe. And that's still not all of the core fundamental changes they made to the game, because they borrowed some mechanics from games like Warcraft, with hero-esque units with special abilities and treasures that a hero can hunt down. This isn't something that is necessarily bad for the game. Hero units existed in Age of Empires 2, but they were only used in the campaign and custom scenarios in certain situations. Inserting them into the general gameplay in the form of explorers actually was one of the things I kind of liked about the game, as it kind of gave you something extra to do in the early game, but it's still worth considering that if you have interesting map generation, then perhaps discovering the map should be its own reward, and explorers and treasures were unnecessary. I'm personally a purist, as you know, and somewhat of a minimalist, and I just feel a scout unit 
even if it is special in some way, would have done the job just as well as the explorer and treasure hunting mechanic. And they also changed pretty much the entire combat mechanics from the previous games. This kind of ties into the whole units having siege mechanics I mentioned earlier. Instead of having distinct attack styles and mechanics, units kind of now share attack types. Some units may have ranged attacks, but they also possess melee attacks. From a thematic standpoint, this makes sense from the Age of Empires 3 universe, but it really just feels like it borrowed the mechanic from games like Cossacks, Dawn of War or Total War. I'm not entirely against this particular feature and I actually quite like it as I think it's a pretty cool idea. But in the sea of all the other changes that the game mechanics got, maybe it was drowned out and didn't get the chance to really stand out and stand as a flagship feature to the series. I think this could have been one of the best areas of gameplay where they could have made things really interesting, but everything else that was changed left it feeling like it was out of place. They they also fundamentally changed the health and damage mechanics. Nearly all units now have special modifiers for attacking different kinds of units, but the bonuses don't seem intuitive to me. In previous iterations of the game, it was pretty obvious what units were good against what. Spearmen are cost efficient against cavalry, skirmishers are cost effective against archers, infantry are cost effective against skirmishers, and so on. It wasn't just this simple. A little bit of micromanagement could turn these fights around depending on the numbers involved, but army composition was really important in dictating the winner of a battle. In Age of Empires 3, Units get these multipliers to their attack power instead of flat bonuses, which makes army composition feel like it matters a lot more, which I felt restricted the developer's ability to make civilizations feel unique as they all needed to have similar tools to deal with enemy units. It felt like the game moved away from mechanics such as splash damage, mobility, range and armor, dictating what units were situationally cost effective, to instead using this weird system of multiplicative damage bonuses and defenses which end up sometimes making some units feel extremely tanky and other units feel extremely squishy in a way that doesn't really feel natural to the flow of the game. A crossbowman might shoot a cavalry and do 10 damage, but if it shoots an infantry it does 20 damage. And that's before we talk about those units having percentage armor reductions in this equation. It, it all makes it feel like the damage numbers are inconsistent and opaque to the player and sometimes even misleading. It just seemed like to me that it was a really convoluted way to achieve what they'd already done before four in the previous games in a less effective, less cohesive manner that was less transparent and harder to learn. Unit upgrades are another area worth talking about from a mechanic standpoint. I mentioned before how units don't really visually change much when they're upgraded and it can even be difficult to tell when a unit is upgraded. But that's not the only thing I feel they got wrong with unit upgrades. Units don't mechanically evolve much either. They simply gain a scaling health and damage boost with each subsequent upgrade and every unit follows the same basic formula of plus 20, 30, 40 and 50% damage and health with each upgrade. There are a couple of exceptions like the guard units or the imperial units, but I feel that this is so boring from a design standpoint. The units are basically the same, but they get a little bit stronger and there's never really have a defining period of strength. Contrast that with Age of Empires 2, if we take just a brief look at the militia line of units, they each have their particular structure and identity in each age with regards to their power level and how they feel relative to other units. Militia are scary purely because of how soon you can get them into your enemy's base and the fact that they're the only military unit available in the Dark Age. The Man at Arms is terrifying almost entirely because of the timing you can hit your opponent with, rolling into their town right as you enter the Feudal Age. They're not scary because they're strong, they're scary because of when you can be hit by them. The Long Swordsman then falls out of favour in the Castle Age as a new era comes about which leaves them in the dust of knights, siege and unique units. Then finally the two-handed swordsman and champion come back into favour in the imperial age as the heroes that can come to save the day and cut down rows upon rows of trash units. This diversity of identity within a single unit line was achieved by giving each unit its own bonuses that differs with each upgrade instead of using Age of Empires 3 flat damage and health boosts which makes each unit feel almost exactly the same in each age with little to no variance in their power relative to other units. 
Getting scaling power bonuses in Age of Empires 3 never really allows for the timings of the units to be strong at different periods of the game. There's no windows of powers because the units follow a formulaic approach to their upgrade structure. They all scale relative to each other perfectly, which hurts the identity of most of the units in my opinion. The game also handles the extra upgrades that you do to your units really poorly in my opinion. It really felt like they deviated again from the formula for the sake of being being different. I honestly don't know how to describe how the upgrade systems work as I, even though I turned on advanced tooltips and tried looking up how they work I'm still not entirely sure. When in previous games it's pretty clear what plus one attack does from the blacksmith upgrades. There's all this text in the tooltips and it doesn't really make an effort to explain itself. All these changes basically destroy the delicate balance between the different unit types that were struck in the previous games. And don't forget they implemented limits on how many of certain buildings you can make and how many units of a certain type you can make, which is a pretty huge departure from the previous games. It all feels convoluted and like changes were made for changes sake and the new things had to be piled on to fix the problems that arose when we were left with something of a tangle of a mess of mechanics that are all trying to limit problems with the game's design. I was about to wrap this up and I'd almost forgotten about the home city system. Listen guys, I'm on page 10 of the script for this video so I'm gonna try to be quick because this thing is getting long. The home city system would have been totally fine if it had been confined to a single player campaign gimmick or handled differently. Unfortunately, it's pervasive even in multiplayer. First of all, progression systems in competitive multiplayer games that make new players weaker than older players are ridiculous as they put a grind wall up in front of a player before they're even capable of considering all of the options available to them in learning the game as well as putting them at a distinct power disadvantage compared to more experienced players. Experienced players are all already more likely to be better at the game than a new player. Why are you also giving them other mechanical advantages? That doesn't make any sense. They also made it so that you had to level up each faction independently, meaning if you wanted to try a new civilization, you had to put in the grinding all over again, which is basically wasted time until you hit the level cap. In fairness, I believe they did fix this in a patch from what I recall, where if you leveled up a city to a certain threshold, new cities would start at a higher level. I'm not convinced that a game needs a progression system to keep it in game. Aging. In fact, progression often turns a lot of people away from your game. In particular, I would argue that a lot of RTS players hate progression systems and are turned away by them more than others. But that's kind of a topic for another video. I'll just say this, if you make a good game, people will play it a lot and there's a lot of games where that's true. If you add a progression system, people might also play your game a little bit more. But where is the line between making a fun, entertaining and engaging experience or making a treadmill for the player to run on psychologically? Now, Age of Empires 3 isn't the worst in regards to the whole progression system thing, but it was sort Sort of the vanguard on the tip of the spear that showed how progression systems and eventually monetization would become so poisonous to our gaming experience. The home system also bleeds into the balance of the game in a very big way. I mentioned before that timings in the game are dictated almost entirely by the home city screen. In particular shipments of wood or units for example to set up in a boom or an attack. There are games where calling off map resources into the game makes sense and maybe Age of Empires 3 could have been one of them. I'm not inherently against the home city system, I'm just against its implementation and design. I would have much preferred it to be a way to activate special abilities for your civilization or perhaps emergency shipments of mercenaries for free that had like a big cost down the line. There could have also been a victory condition associated with the home city system like having to ship a certain amount of resources home in order to activate an economic victory. I just don't really enjoy the way they did it. I have a hard time explaining exactly what my issues are with the home city system, but I felt like it took too much of a focus away from the actual act of interacting with the game and made it about playing this sort of weird extra layer of card games too much, which I'm not really a fan of. I like a game to be relatively simple but deep rather than having complex layers of approachable mechanics. The sorts of designs and mechanics that I discussed would have been far more interesting to me than some weird gamey progression system that lets you call in off map resources and discourages players from interacting directly with the fundamental game mechanics in favour of using this weird gimmicky layer that reduces the usefulness of scouting. Instead of going to your opponent's base, looking at what resources he's taking, you can just go peek at his deck and get an idea of 
what he's planning. It's oddly opaque and transparent at the same time. You can tell what their general strategy will be, but you have no idea what their execution of that strategy will be without perfect scout timings on their shipments. I think the Comb City system also contributed to making the game feel really small. You weren't trying to make an empire, you were making a shitty little outpost of another empire. I understand that a lot of people really like the home city system, and I've heard a lot of really good arguments in favour of it, but to me it just kind of felt out of place for the franchise. It did feel in place for the setting of the game, but I just didn't like the way it was implemented. I think at the very least that you can respect that part of my argument, even if you do personally like the home city system. I have my final few gripes here with the game before I end this video. When you select units they're all balled into a big pile in the UI grouped by unit type instead of in the previous games where you would get a list of each individual unit's portrait. This actually kind of makes certain kinds of micro harder to pull off without really giving the player much in the way of information as a trade-off. If you have a very small number of units it's really easy to count them and check if you meet the quantity threshold for one-shotting a villager for example. And if you have a lot of units they're uncountable but the number really doesn't matter at that point because the difference between five and seven units can be pretty large, but when it comes to 25 versus 27 when judging army size, giving the player the exact number doesn't really help them and it may actually discourage them from developing a game sense or feeling about how an engagement is going to go by comparing relative army sizes and compositions at a glance and instead relying on this number crutch. This is a pretty important skill for a player to learn and getting in the way of villager distribution micro and learning how to read a battle to present the player with information they can easily obtain by counting when it matters doesn't seem like good design. Also, villagers don't repair buildings anymore, as I forgot to mention that earlier, that's yet another fundamental game mechanic change that changes how the game feels in my opinion. And you know, all this stuff, it, it just feels like change is made for change's sake. It feels like they were trying to solve problems that weren't really problems to the majority of players. I've probably said that a few times throughout this video, but I stand by this statement. The game feels like an unfocused mess that's more like a bad sequel to Age of Mythology than the sequel that Age of Empires deserved. This is going to be a controversial statement, but I would honestly have no problem with erasing Age of Empires 3 from the franchise's history and just letting a new developer have a second go at it. That's how strongly I feel about the game. I just, I just don't really like it at all. And there you have it, every single complaint that I could come up with for Age of Empires 3 condensed into a rambling mess of a video. There are some things I did actually like the idea of, trade units, native units, and that ships and forts can build different kinds of units, but I didn't really get to talk about this and the video is getting kind of long. Now, despite what I've said, I actually don't hate the game. I'm just angry that I didn't get the game that I wanted. It left me feeling kind of disappointed. It felt like it was rushed out to meet a deadline after being in development hell and it wasn't given the proper time to mature into the game it should have been. There is a good game in there, there's just a lot of stuff that needed to be fixed before that amazing game could really flex its muscles. I'm the sort of person who loves franchises to iterate rather than innovate and Age of Empires 3 innovated way too much to my liking. Anyway, feel free to call me a piece of shit in the comments if you like Age of Empires 3. This video took me like 40 hours of work to research, write, record and edit so at the very least you can do do is call me names and give the video a thumbs up or a thumbs down and maybe consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoy giving ego boosts to YouTube based sociopaths. Also the maps in Age of Empires 3 are circular for some reason and it makes me want to die inside. I'm Potato McWhiskey and I love you all very much and I'll see you next time. <laughs> bye bye.